Welcome to Conversations That Count, a podcast series hosted by MAS in celebration of International Women's Day this year. I'm your host, Anki Premachandra, and in this conversation, we are going to talk about diversity and intentional inclusion in the workplace. I'm joined by my guests, Kisaru Gunasekara um, from JKH and Nirasha Don Karolis from MAS Holdings. Welcome. All right, let's dive straight into conversation. And Nyasha, I'm going to pose my first question to you. We've been speaking about the importance of changing mindset. We can talk about policies, transformational change, all we want. But if we don't inculcate a mindset of acceptance, um, none of these policies will really see the light of day. Why is changing mindset really important to this conversation? So, Anki, I think um, for a long time, uh, diversity and inclusion was, a, let's say, a tagline that a lot of corporates used and um, you know over time it has become one of those uh, variables that determine <clears throat> your stock's performance uh, on the in the world market so it has evolved over time uh, and in its evolution I think uh, the term diversity and inclusion has been used interchangeably but the thing is they're not really interchangeable and that's where mindset comes in. An organization can have a diverse workforce in terms of uh, race, nationality, gender, sexual orientation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the organization is an inclusive organization. They may achieve diversity because of policies, quotas, etc. Sometimes things that we call a checkbox uh, uh, initiative, but to truly benefit from that diversity and truly add value to that diverse workforce, they would need to inculcate inclusivity. And to do that, you would have to change the mindset. You would have to take out those biases. You would have to sensitize, raise awareness, and uh, have triggers that force behaviors that represent a changed mindset when it comes to these biases that we have held for many, 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 many years. So I think that's where mindset change becomes critical to this journey. Especially from this coming from this part of the world, unlearning some of the ingrained stereotypes um, is a very important part of this journey. Um, so Isuru, I'm moving to you with sort of my next question on intentional inclusion, because I think that was a very interesting point Niasha touched on. Um, what is John Keel's um, doing right now to kind of push that message of intentional inclusion? Taking off from the previous point, it's an important one to first set the base, right? The, um, how you inculcate that inclusive mindset is really the key to begin with. Um, you know, they say diversity is being invited for the party, but inclusion is making sure everybody dances, right? One of the first challenges that we had when first set on, our, set on this journey is how do we make sure that people understand that we are not moving away from meritocracy? because that in fundamentally is really the foundation of how we sort of recruit, how we promote. What we want to do is to make sure that we create an environment that is conducive for more females to participate in the workplace and at the mid to senior levels so that the pool to choose from becomes much larger and hence as a result you have people moving forward. We have, don't have that inclusive mindset really at the beginning. People do make it a checkbox People do question the credibility of what we do. It's a lot of conversations that we need to have and we can't expect people to jump onto the bandwagon at the immediate outset and we can't expect people to be on the same page. And those tough conversations will continue to happen because you have churn. You don't necessarily create a, um, you know, a, an inclusive mindset in one moment. It is always progressive. So as long as we keep working on it constantly, we keep chipping away at that block, but it's never an end game and it's always a challenge. So this is really interesting. We're talking about a diverse pool. We're saying it's not only important that you have um, gender diverse policies um, in a company, it's also important that you start in the hiring process to make sure that the pool you choose from is diverse. How do your companies go about this? You know, at the start, as you said, the ticking the boxes to say at an, in an advert to say we're an equal opportunity employer, right? That's just a message that doesn't necessarily make people feel we are diverse or that we really respect every um, difference. At JK specifically, having the 100-day parental leave um, took away the stigma attached to hiring women immediately. So men and women are on the same page. And so these actions are what makes it work. It's really not the tagline. 
Um, and I think it's training on unconscious bias, awareness on you know the different types of genders. Um, in our JKH, we actually help somebody transition through a gender transformation. And that created a lot of discussions among the organization. There were challenges, there were lots of opposition, um, but it was really a sort of a conversation that we needed to have and we're still having it. I think one of the uh, significant moments is when JKH uh, announced the 100 day fraternity leave. You know, it was a very inspiring moment for us as another corporate, for me as a female, uh, because that was really uh, taking a huge leap forward to take some of that stigma away. So one of the things that we used to have at Kiel supermarkets, for example, was um, previously maybe five to six years ago, was that all the meat counters were serviced by males um, because all the chefs and everybody thought that's a ma man's job, you know, cutting meat, cleaning fish and things like that. And we realized that unless we change non-traditional roles to be more gender diverse, we really can't move the needle, right, because of scale. So we started a campaign called Hire a Woman or Explain and also trained the chefs to say, look, you know what, females can do that job. We may need to make certain changes to the infrastructure, lower the counters, make the crates a little lighter, you know, things like that. Um, and now more than 50% of the staff behind the meat counters are serviced by women. Um, so it took about five years, but that in itself showed that you can change the mindset of the people um, and really move the needle at scale. You know, this part of the world, sometimes we do tend to grow up with um, lots of stereotypes that um, tend to exclude um, and based on differences. Um, how has sort of MAS uh, tackled that journey? I think maybe for now, six, seven, eight years, we have had uh, programs running on uh, sensitizing people to unconscious bias. Uh, so we have a system by which, uh, as, as Isru referred to earlier, you know, there's a certain amount of churn in an organization. So you can have awareness and uh, sensitization campaigns, but you have to run it constantly because there'll always be new yeah. leaders, new employees coming into the organization. And we run the programs on uh, unconscious bias, uh, diversity, uh, accessibility, and respect. And we always link it back to those organization values uh, to help us see the world differently, to wear a different lens when we look at people and their performances and their suitability. I don't think there's an end game, as I said, uh, or an end uh, point in this. I think for the rest of time, we will have to do it, you know, continue to educate people. And seven years ago, it was uh, really about females in the workplace, in a very traditional male-dominated workplace, going into non-traditional roles. And today it's about people also of diverse uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. So it is that constant education, sensitization, having those these conversations that count at, at the most senior level, all the way down to all the management levels, and maybe one day also uh, to the shop floor because uh, a great majority of our uh, workforce is uh, shop floor employees, uh, almost maybe 80,000 uh, working at the machines. And whilst we have done a lot of work around female empowerment, um, I think uh, we are still very early in our journey talking about uh, gender uh, identities and uh, diverse sexual orientation. So that that is something we are still, you know, uh, doing. Let's say there is no shortcut to it. I think it's a constant effort at uh, educating, sensitizing, you know, having those conversations and, and, and integrating it into the fabric of the company. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely really important. And because you have such big cadres and, you know, um, because you are such big corporations with a very diverse pool of um, employees, and by diverse, I'm not talking about gender, I'm talking about mindset, I'm talking about culture um, and, and what people kind of bring to the table in terms of their um, social experiences. What are some of the challenges that you guys have been having when it comes to making um, your workplace inclusive or when trying to push intentional inclusion? For JKH, I think the diversity of the organization it's, itself is a challenge. Um, some businesses, if you talk about gender in terms of females and males, I'll start with that. Um, some uh, industries obviously has you know a starting point where there is a very diverse workforce and an equal representation. Um, but some industries don't, and some job types don't. 
um, and we don't have as big a cadre as, as MAS. Um, but for example, if you take our leisure sector, and this is something that people don't really realize possibly, is that only 12%, and this is across the industry, um, are females in the leisure industry in hotels in Sri Lanka. Um, oh, it's, only 12%. Yeah, yeah, so getting it to 15% has been an interim growth. Um, and that in itself is a challenge because the leisure industry has a stigma attached to it, especially in the rural areas. Um, so we've had um, we've had things like open days within the businesses in the hotels for the parents to come and see where their daughters will work because you have to get stationed there. There are dormitories. Um, they would much rather join the garment industry because they feel that that is more female friendly and doesn't have a stigma attached to the leisure industry with hotels and hotel rooms and there is something that comes with that. Um, so change in that mindset has been the biggest challenge. And then the obvious ones are, for example, you know, your IT industry, your STEM, STEM industries. Um, and that has to really start from education and the schooling system. Like you said, you know, that pool is the most difficult one to find when you look at your IT and your engineering and things like that. Um, so increasing female participation in STEM schooling system and getting them involved in that at that point is really the catalyst for changing that at the employment stage. So I think diversity of the industries has been the biggest challenge in, at JKH. I think the, the pandemic gave us uh, maybe, maybe reversed some progress, but it also gave us a platform to go forward because for example, at MAS, um, we had flexi working policies in place, but uh, I, I think it really took off during the pandemic, we proved that you can run this huge organization by working from home. And um, I think that was a huge uh, uh, step up for us because I think we managed to retain so many females that we would have lost uh, because they couldn't keep going in their career journey uh, with other demands on their time. But flexi working, work from home, gave them an opportunity to manage some of those demands. And an overwhelming challenge that we face in this part of the world is the societal challenge. So we can have the policies and the um, processes and the goals and the KPIs and the infrastructure within the organization. But if there is no acceptance outside the organization, it's still going to be hard. We need families, friends, society, network to support us in our journey. Our organization only supporting will not be enough. At MAS also, we try to educate you know, our workforce uh, that they also have to work with those outside stakeholders to get the support they need to move in their career. And I think that's a challenge that corporates like JKH and, and MAS can also push in the in, in, in society, yeah. you know, when we try to model the right way and enable people to be the best they can be, yeah. I think then society also has to turn around and say, yes, we will stop judging and we will start supporting. Coming to the conclusion of this podcast, the last thing I want to ask the both of you is what you're most excited about. What is MAS and JKH thinking of and what plans do you have for the future? If I take a look at the um, the ethos behind the one JKH brand, as it were, we have three trusts. Uh, one is achieving gender parity. The other one is um, being inclusive of the LGBTIQ plus community. And the third one is increasing career opportunities for PWDs. We have different tracks on these three different areas and different, you know, raft of different initiatives. You know, the progress has been encouraging uh, in all the areas, but I would be the first one to admit that it's not as fast as we would like. You know, we've set ourselves a goal of achieving 40% by 2025. We've moved the needle from 28 to 33% over the last three years, but it's been much slower. For us, it's about making sure that the mindset change we spoke of at the beginning of the conversation continues to be more inculcated and more in our DNA and that every single step that we take towards recruitment, towards promotions, everything, that it is a part and parcel of our thinking process. Um, and it is not those last two checkboxes that you have to make sure that you, you know, kind of attend to. But really, like you said, increasing the pool, increasing that, you know, having that uh, baseline um, part of the DNA. So a lot of work to be done. I think we're still scratching the surface as much as, you know, as, as proud as we are about what we've done. 
there's a lot to be done as as isru said we also have defined uh, goals for ourselves in terms of gender parity we want to be uh, at 30% uh, female uh, leaders in the company by 2025 Uh, I'm not sure that we'll be there exactly. We are going to be about 26% this year. So in a year, we'd have to move the needle uh, quite a bit next year. More recently started uh, raising awareness and uh, doing sensitization ar- ar- around uh, diverse gender and sexual orientation. Uh, we realize that we have to take the learnings and the wins that we have had in in the whole female empowerment space and apply it to this uh space as well and being in different countries across the world with very different cultures brings its uh, complexities uh to us um but uh, we are confident that we can do the same thing with those of uh, diverse gender identity and sexual orientation i mean this was a very inspiring conversation thank you so much for your time and for the incredible work that you are doing to make sure that your organizations are accepting um for all thank you very much thank you, thank you.